Whoa, what, what's all this stuff? This doesn't look like the start of an awful archaeology episode. As I mentioned at the start of my last couple videos, I have opened a P.O. box, which you can see in very small letters here, and you can see by the graces of my wonderful editor in much larger letters right here. And after collecting all of the packages that I got in my P.O. box over the course of the last three or four weeks, I finally have done my first unboxing, which I have posted on my brand new second channel. My second channel is going to be home to all the sort of non-professional stuff that wouldn't go on this channel, whether it be unboxings or urbex or vlogs or really whatever I damn well please. So if you want to check out the first episode of my archaeological unboxing, make sure to check that out. The link is in the description of this video. Also follow that one because I just got my first video demonetized on this channel because education is dangerous apparently. I'd like to thank you all for watching and without further ado, let's get right into the episode. stole this pillar from a grave site. Oh yeah, it looks so much better in my living room. Howdy friends, my name is Milo, and welcome to Awful Archaeology, the show where I spin this bingo wheel which I got from Target in order to randomly pick one of these archaeological conspiracy theories to talk about in depth. As you may remember, once upon a time I did have a roulette wheel that I would spin and then pick the archaeological conspiracies that way, but for those of you who don't know, I managed to lose the wheel. How you lose something that is digital? I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. So going forward, every single episode of this progressively more painful series is going to be picked by this ball of balls. Last episode, we talked about the Dendera Light, an Egyptian carving which conspiracy theorists will claim is proof that ancient Egyptians had working electric lights. At the time when we filmed that video, I was still uh, between random picking methods, and so I decided to just pick the next conspiracy myself. And I decided it would make a lot of sense to stick with the theme of ancient electricity conspiracy theories, which is why, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to present to you this episode of Awful Archaeology, where I will be telling you everything you need to know about the... One of these days, I am going to spell one of my slides wrong and I'm not going to notice and I'm gonna get so many comments about it. Baghdad Battery, let's get going. Typically, when you look at a term like the Baghdad Battery, it would be logical to infer that it was found in the city of Baghdad. You would, however, be wrong. I could probably actually move this now because I need that space for images, but I'll be using this later. Temporary moving of the stolen artifacts. The Baghdad Battery was an artifact discovered in the Iraqi city of Salman Pak, which at the time was known as Rajut Rabu. Rajut Rabu. The city of Baghdad is located along the Tigris River, and the location where the batteries were discovered is located about 15 miles to the south. While today this settlement is known as Salman Pak, in antiquity it was known as al Madain, as is indicated by my terrible handwriting. And because this site is located along such an important arterial river, it has seen human habitation for thousands of years. And because of that, it is home to countless archaeological sites, one of the most impressive being Tak Kasra, which is the remains of a Persian palace, which is not only beautiful, but also holds an incredibly specific architectural achievement, because it is the second largest single-span unreinforced piece of brickwork in the entire world. So if any of you guys have a world record that you want to beat, <laughs> I say pick up some bricks and get started. Okay, back on track. al is undoubtedly the most well-known for the discovery of the Baghdad Battery, which I should state right off the bat is a very sensationalized name. By calling it the Baghdad Battery, you are already told to assume its purpose. It's very similar to calling the Dendera car the Dendera Light. So the Baghdad Battery is a bit of a sensationalized name which is given to a discovery which could very easily be called the Parthian Jars, due to the fact that they were created by the Parthian Empire, which existed from about 200 BCE to about 200 AD. And because they were discovered in 1936, the actual recordings of their discovery are sparse, if not unrecorded entirely. As in the 1930s, there was by and large very little care taken for archaeological diligence, as much of it was unfortunately 
unfortunately a for-profit business. Even everyone's favorite Hollywood archaeologist acknowledges this in Indiana Jones, where at the very beginning of the first movie, he talks about selling some artifacts to a museum in order to be able to fund a trip to go recover another artifact. We do know that the Baghdad Battery was first analyzed by Wilhelm Koenig. In 1938, he was the director of the Museum of Antiquities in Baghdad. But the problem is we have no idea where it was actually found. To the best of our knowledge, the jars were discovered as part of the excavation for a rail line in 1936. We don't know if they were discovered by Koenig, who was an acting archaeologist at the time, or if they were discovered by a worker and just donated to the museum. Either way, it is very important to remember uh, for this story going forward that we don't actually know what these jars were like in situ. I've had a couple people ask me in the comments what it means, so I'm gonna write down a vocab word. I really am starting to just fill the shoes of the weird substitute teacher, aren't I? In archaeology, the term in situ refers to an artifact's sense of place. One of the most important things in the discipline is context. When an artifact is found in situ and you remove it, you are removing all of the context that that artifact once had. And in doing that, you can lose more information than you would by just having the artifact. For example, if you were to see a stone spearhead in a museum, Museum, you have no idea where it was found. It could have been included as a grave good. It could have been found lodged in animal bone. The region and depositional layer that it was found at could all tell you things about this piece's story. But those are things that you can only learn by it being in situ. Either way, that's a long way of saying that we have absolutely no idea where these jars came from, which to us as archaeologists is probably the most important piece of information that we could ever ask for. The find is supposedly around 2200 years old, but of course we can't be sure because this analysis was done in the 1930s and they were taken out of context. And the find consisted of four unglazed ceramic jars. Each one of them measured about five inches tall and about three and a half inches across. Of the four jars that were found, one of them contained a piece of heavily deteriorated papyrus, and the other three contained a cylindrical tube made out of copper, as you can see here in my artist's rendering. Each one of the copper tubes is equipped with a bottom which was soldered on with lead, and of these three which were found to contain a copper tube, one of them was found with a iron rod which was held in place in the copper tube by an asphalt plug. Something which I was very confused about when I was researching this was the usage of the term asphalt because I associate it with highways, and road maintenance, and redlining. So I think of it as a very modern thing, but asphalt is just a, another name for bitumen, which is kind of like a black tar substance. Now again, I want to make really, really clear while we have all four of these drawn, that only one of them has the asphalt plug and the iron rod in it. The other three are functionally completely different from one another. There was some theorization that these ones did also contain an iron rod at some point because there was other iron rods found at the grave site, supposedly. But again, we have no records of the grave site and we have no evidence that these were ever implemented as part of this apparatus. So every single thing that we have to support this conspiracy going forward is based off of just this a single jar. So here is my wonderful uh, rendition of the Baghdad Battery. The final piece of evidence that Koenig found to suggest to him that this was some sort of uh, electric cell was the presence of a residue which suggested an electrolyte within the container. Probably wasn't Pedialyte or Man Pedialyte. Yeah, it's for fucking men. I got so shit-faced last night that I needed some Pedialyte. <laughs> my tummy hurts. Or any other one of those gimmicky, like, electrolyte drinks that you would buy at CVS for $7. It's more likely that the acid used here would have been lemon juice or vinegar or wine or something which would have been, you know, much more accessible. Now, Koenig's deduction from all of this was that what he was looking at was the remains of an ancient battery. And that idea spread like wildfire. And it has been perpetuated by today's modern conspiracy theorists from YouTube to the History Channel. So folks, let's get into doing what I do best, telling you what this battery is, what it isn't, and most importantly, The stolen artifact is coming back. Last episode, I got very frustrated with the sheer idiocy of a lot of the conspiracy theorists I was talking about. And I asked my wonderful partner to uh, make me a drink. Um, now this was met with <laughs> some uh, mostly positive feedback and a couple people uh, who, what was that one? Gets mad at idiots on TV for being racist, makes white fix him a drink. Which taught me two things. One, we're married apparently. Uh, that's news to me. <laughs> And two, fellas, is it racist to have a loving partner? <laughs> is it racist to be loved? <laughs> is it racist to be loved? 
<laughs> so for the rest of this series, going forward, I'm going to have a themed drink every single video. I, I am no mixologist, so to undertake this enormous operation, I have partnered with uh, Rhode Island Foodie, who has a TikTok account that I have followed pretty much since I got TikTok. He makes just some absolutely beautiful drinks, as you can see here. So he's really going to be the brains behind this operation and help come up with all of these unbelievably creative and beautiful drinks. So today he has used all of those mixologist skills uh, to create a drink, which we are going to call the Baghdad Battery. Obviously, he is not here today making it. My lovely wife is going to make this drink for me. It's got rum. It's got... Uh, lemon juice as an homage to the uh, electrolyte in the battery. It's got some apricot in it for kind of that Mediterranean inspired uh, thing going on. Look at that. That is beautiful, honey. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Am I allergic to apricots? Maybe. Am I a bitch? Absolutely the fuck not. Now stir that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Son of a... Dude, that is so yes. fucking good. Wow, that's the first one? Man, he's killing it. That's so good. All right, I'd like to give a massive thank you to Newport Foodie for helping make this possible and for agreeing to do this really weird project with me for the rest of this series. So please follow him on Instagram and on YouTube and on TikTok, where you can see all of his beautiful drinks, which will surely spice up any event you have, whether it be a large uh, catering situation, or you feeling like drinking along with me here on uh, Awful Archaeology. So cheers to you. Thank you very much. And uh, let's get right back into it. God, that's so fucking good. Shoo, shoo, get out of here. Man, can't have shit. your favorite part of the video. It's the part where I look at terrible conspiracy videos and tell them that they're wrong. I feel that there is no better way to understand the conspiracies surrounding this video than by looking at the documentation of someone who believes in it in order to better understand the way they think and so that we can see really what it's built upon, if anything. I'd like to give a massive thank you to my Discord user, Akari Kuzu, who helped me uh, compile this list of videos to look at. So thank you very much. Your research was invaluable in doing this, and I greatly appreciate you. So the first video that we're going to be looking at is called History Documentary, colon, Ancient Egypt Electricity, question mark, Ancient History of High Advanced Technology Evidence. It has 39,000 views and it is from a channel called Ancient World with 2.7 thousand subscribers. <laughs> Well, that's a weird start. I don't think that was an audio error. The, the sound just sort of stops. <laughs> I, I watched that like two times in order to make sure it wasn't my computer, but they just cut out the sound effect at the intro. <sighs> Bro, what is it with every single video or piece of media that wants to convey that it takes place in the Middle East using the music goes like, Wah, 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 wah. It's like, I, I, at some point, I feel like it's just highly, highly racist. <laughs> Today, we take for granted nightly city skylines. Oh my god, and it uses like the automated voice thing? Jesus Christ. Street lights, and the overall power that drives our modern convenience. Whoa, did you see that in the top left? I, I think that was a UFO. <laughs> Can't believe they missed an opportunity to make this video about UFOs. Could the wise men of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia have had knowledge of electricity? even electric illumination? Within the framework of some archaeological evidence, the answer seems affirmative. The key word in that sentence is some, and I feel like some is even an overstatement. I, I don't really think anyone who is genuinely in the field of archaeology believes this. And, and the less important word is evidence, because there's definitely not much of that, as we will be seeing moving forward. That entire sentence was a very funny way of just saying, so based on pretty much nothing. The most widely cited evidence that the ancient Egyptians used electricity as a relief beneath the Temple of Hathor at Dendera, Egypt that depicts figures standing around. God damn it, they're talking about the fucking Tendera light again. I already did a video on this. Jesus, there's a reason I did these two videos together. I feel like they are clumped together in the conspiracy circle enough that 
it's necessary to talk about them both together. Okay, no more Dendera light. I'm skipping ahead to him actually talking about the Baghdad battery. An artifact found a ways away from Egypt, outside of modern day Baghdad. Wait a second, so he acknowledges that the Baghdad battery was found a ways away from Egypt, and yet conspiracy theorists will consistently associate these two finds with each other. I, I really cannot wrap my head around the train of thought which involves looking at a carving and then drawing from a completely different find in a completely different part of the world and then just being like, yes, these two things were associated with one another. Actually, no, you know what? It, it makes a lot of sense that these two things are lumped together, because while they may be in very different parts of the world, they are all parts of the world which would open in a Hollywood movie with music that goes wah, 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 wah. Shows some electricity production was possible in the Middle East thousands of years ago. Mm, yeah, but was it though? Was it really? Are you gonna cite that? Are you gonna give us evidence for that? Because I don't think it was. Okay, he also says it generates some electricity. So I'm very curious <laughs> to see how much electricity it actually generates. This artifact is known as the Baghdad battery. Now, you may remember at the beginning of this video, I mentioned to you that each one of the Baghdad batteries was about five inches tall. Each one of these looks like they're about a foot and a half, maybe more. And, and that is the kind of experimental archaeology that you will find so frequently destroys all of these conspiracy videos. By having a specific outcome in mind, they will change their experiment in order to guarantee that outcome. I've talked about the Talima fighter jets, and of course the Dendera light. It's really just amazing that they can get away with this and they use it as actual evidence because it is so far removed from experimental archaeology that it's comedic to even associate them with one another. We try to figure out, how did the ancients in Egypt achieve their artistic and technical perfection in total darkness. Okay, okay. So you'd think that if a video is at its peak, it's at the, like, climax of the video where they're about to drop the bombshell, and he says that the battery in experiments works, you'd think that he would then go on to talk about how the experiment worked, right? The results of it, what it was able to power, you know, how it worked. Uh, but no, instead he just starts talking about the Temple of Dendera and how could they have lit it when it is dark inside if you don't have lights? Which, for those of you who don't know, uh, as I mentioned in my last video, there's two ways. First is that they had um, olive oil lamps, and the second is that they didn't put the fucking roof on until they were finished carving because they weren't idiots. But that's really beside the point. Let's take it back a step to the it works. He glosses over the most important point here, which is exactly how much power this battery could produce, and there's a reason he does that. Smith University actually tested a replica of the Baghdad battery themselves, and they produced from one battery a grand total of 1.1 volts, which is less power than a AAA battery. In fact, it is so little power that you probably wouldn't even be able to feel it all that much if you were to touch the positive and negative inputs. This is also with a fully modern setup. We have no idea what the purity of the copper they were using was, or the purity of the iron, or hell, what sort of electrolyte they were using. I'm not an electrician, but I would be willing to bet that if you were to try and make a battery using lemon juice, vinegar, and water, Line, some would be better than others. So we are looking at a battery that in the modern world at peak performance would probably produce just over a volt of power. Dude, the comments on this video are insane. The video itself is one thing, but the comments under it are something else entirely. Ancient civilizations were more advanced than our era, and someone responds with, more advanced than our iPhone 11? Lol. <laughs> That's fucking good. <laughs> Electricity, bro, it's obvious. Who cares if they don't accept it? They will come around also when we need God reveals information to us so they can feel silly about rejecting the truth when the time comes. I can't believe that I voluntarily chose this as a job. All right, I've had enough of YouTube. YouTube sucks. Let's move on to the wonderful cesspool that I like to call TikTok. Another day. Jesus Christ, that is the loudest bird noise I have ever heard in my life. My God, why would you ever start a video with something that loud? So this is a video uh, from an account called The Star Child, which I've been tagged in a lot of his videos. His channel is full of just countless cold takes and pseudoscience, and so I'm sure that uh, what he has to say on the Baghdad battery is going to be insightful, to say the least. Another day, another mystery. How do you explain this one, the Baghdad battery? I mean, this is a weird one. <laughs> This is a weird one. I'm, I'm not one for using scientific language, as is evidenced by the fact that despite holding a degree, I'm standing up here swearing while I teach. 
But I do find it very funny when people use such informal words to describe things like that. It's a pretty weird one, am I right? It was found in 1936 near Baghdad in Iraq, and it has been dated to 250 BC. And well, it looks like a battery. But could it actually have been okay, one? Okay, I'm, I'm taking a sip for that. I do think it would be very funny to implement a drinking game. And so allow me to propose uh, the very first thing uh, which I'm going to have to drink to every time I watch one of these videos. And that is somebody saying, looks like. Because the amount of conspiracy theories that involve things looking like something else is fucking groundbreaking. Salute. Well, both Mythbusters and the natural scientist Anna Egebrecht did an- It's a funny lineup. The Mythbusters and natural scientist Anna Egebrecht. Name a more iconic duo. <laughs> Experiment to see if the batteries would actually work. Guess what? They did. They did? They worked? Well, how much power did they produce? Although they only produced a small amount of electricity- Although they only produced a small amount of electricity, but they worked, they worked. It would be enough to light up a light bulb. Okay, so if it's enough to light up a light bulb, you would expect to find, uh, let's see, uh, sockets, wires, light bulbs, which you don't find any of. So just because it's enough to light up a light bulb doesn't mean that it would actually light up a light bulb. Could that explain the Dendera light bulb? This hieroglyph can be found in the same temple. Jesus, the temple of Dendera again. No, 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 next. I think the fact that every video we've watched so far has brought up the Temple of Hathor really goes to show how terrible this conspiracy is. Because they literally only have two things to go off when talking about it. Did the ancients actually have and made use of electricity? To talk about both sides, skeptics of the artifact Skeptics. I feel like calling people that don't think a 2200 year old clay jar that could maybe produce about a volt of electricity skeptics is a very interesting application of the term. Skeptics of the artifact claim that it's about 700 years younger and that their purpose was to keep papyruses safe. Don't get me wrong, it seems reasonable to me. The papyrus theory is something which I'm going to get into later in this video, but it's another interpretation which has far more archaeological foundation but is one that I still don't fully agree with. So it's very interesting. I want you to keep in mind that he says that it seems reasonable because I will show you why it is probably one of the least reasonable things I have heard uh, al alongside it being used to power electric lights that didn't exist. But the same author also said building the pyramids of Egypt would be easy? Hey, he didn't... The author didn't say that the building the pyramids of Egypt would be easy. He just said it didn't require a high level of technological skill. Which, I mean, is a sort of fair point. I feel like it's a little belittling, uh, but I'm, I mean... To give him a little bit of benefit of the doubt, it would really rely more on just a huge amount of laborers rather than, you know, a bunch of people making tons of inter intricate carvings. It's more coordinationally and scalarly impressive. Okay, back on track, Jesus Christ. So I think at this point it is safe to say that we can all agree that this was not a device used to power electric lights. But there is one part of this conspiracy which I still haven't been able to dispel yet, and that is whether or not it was a battery. As we saw in the experiments carried out by Mythbusters and by Smith University, the Baghdad battery is actually capable of producing power. It is, to be fair, an infinitesimal amount in comparison to how much you would need to actually run a power grid, and it is still a one off find, but it's kind of hard to argue with that, isn't it? But we don't find anything that this technology could have powered. No wires and no bulbs, but just because it's not a very high power battery doesn't mean that it's not a battery. Because light bulbs aren't the only theory, and some people think that it could have been used for... <laughs> While there is not a single archaeologist who believes that the Baghdad battery was used to power ancient electric lights, there are some theories that it was used with an electrical application just for something else. That something else being electroplating. Now this is a particularly interesting thing to talk about, especially as part of this series, because so many of the artifacts and finds that we discuss are bullshit to the core. Things which are obviously black and white. For example, we had our footprint episode where there is not a single human footprint to be found alongside dinosaur tracks. There is nothing arguable about that. But what's so interesting about this find is that there is a very good chance that the Baghdad battery was used in some way to produce electricity. It's the applications of that electricity that we don't really know. But even the very logical applications of this electric process can be muddied by the waters of conspiracy theorists who take up a lot of the airspace on it. And as someone who is constantly on a search for fact, I would like to thank 
today's sponsor. Because today's sponsor is Ground News. Ground News is the very first news comparison website, which allows you to weigh news articles from different sides of the political spectrum. We are all heavily aware, especially here in the United States, that news is incredibly political. And as consumers, it is all too easy to just be fed whatever is given to us. Algorithms will suggest us only things which fit into our thought bubble, which can be very comforting, but is also very damaging to anyone who wants to broaden their horizons and learn more and the truth about the world around them. I am a huge fan of this service, and since they reached out to me, I have been using it quite a bit in order to learn about the goings-on in the world. You can see the biases of the different media outlets which are talking about certain topics, as well as easily access all of those articles so you can see how people are talking about it from different sides of the political aisle. Ground News has over 150,000 people, locations, and topics that it covers, allowing you to do a keyword search and be able to find every sort of article about any topic that you could really think of. The coronavirus, the war in Ukraine, or pretty much any sort of political race anywhere in the world. One of the things that I appreciate the most about it is it is not just an American-focused news organization, and it has worldwide coverage of topics from everywhere. Because of this, I am able to broaden my worldview beyond the borders of the good old US of A, despite the fact that all of the news which is pushed to me on social media is all United States-focused. If you are looking for a better way to stay informed about all of the current events around the world, you can go to this link or click the link in my bio. It helps me out, it helps the channel out, it'll help you out. It's really a win-win situation. I'd like to thank Ground News not only for sponsoring this video, but also helping fight the fight for truth. And now without further ado, let's talk about electroplating. Electroplating is exactly what it sounds like. It is using electricity to plate something. The apparatus you need in order to electroplate something consists of uh, two different pieces of metal, a negative cathode, which in this case I'm using as iron, and a positive anode, which in this case is going to be copper. Actually, wait, no, we're gonna say that this is silver. Now, if you were to then fill this tub with a solution of gold cyanide and then apply a current to this, you could theoretically plate the silver with the gold. If you were then to apply a current to this, you could theoretically create a reaction which would allow for the gold in the liquid solution to adhere to the silver creating something which I like to call electroplating. <laughs> this would obviously be a very thin sheet of gold and something which would be very hard to do manually. Now, there are places in the Middle East that have a very long history of uh, metal plating. So there is a theory, which is that the Baghdad battery was used uh, in order to electroplate metal, which on its own, I mean, that doesn't sound like too bad of a theory, does it? But you know I'm here to suck the joy out of everything. This theory was explored more in depth in a paper written by Professor Gerard Egard. This paper of his discusses how it could have been possible to electroplate something using the Baghdad battery. The difficult things to get to actually make this process work would be zinc and gold cyanide. Uh, zinc has been known about since Roman times, so theoretically it would have been possible for uh, the Parthians to have had some access to it, though there is currently no evidence that the Parthians really had any sort of interaction with large quantities of zinc. The most recent large-scale production of zinc comes from India, which could be in the appropriate region, but it didn't take place until nearly a thousand years later. So we're already in a little bit of a wishy-washy place with zinc. As for gold cyanide, there's still a chance they could have been able to make it. Gold was no stranger to the ancient world, as many of you are very painfully aware. So it's the acquisition of cyanide which would have been a lot more difficult. Dr. D.E. Vanderhoff, who also published a paper on this topic, uh, has one particular theory for where this cyanide could have came from. He suggests that it could have come from the cassava root, which is a staple in Africa. But when I was reading this paper, I was curious because I'd heard of the cassava root before, and so I did a little bit of Googling, and it's endemic to South America. And after a little bit more Googling, I found that it wasn't introduced to Africa until Portuguese sailors brought it there in like the 17th century. So I have no idea if Dr. Vanderhoff just overlooked this, or if he's just completely wrong. I have no idea why the Parthians would have sailed all the way across the ocean to South America to take a route. Now back to Dr. Eggart's paper, he actually mentions some very logical places where the ancient Parthians could have acquired cyanide from. You can find cyanide in trace amounts in almonds, in peaches, in apple seeds, and in the pits of apricots. Cheers. By crushing all of these pits and combining them with yeast and water and a little bit of gold dust, one could have produced a sort of 
gold cyanide. Now, personally, I think that the electroplating theory is just about as much of a stretch as the light bulb theory. Despite sounding like it's a lot more grounded in reality, uh, there are a couple reasons why I think that this theory is erroneous at best. Firstly, the one volt that you're going to be getting from this battery probably would not be enough to really effectively electroplate anything. And the last and probably most important piece of evidence for why I think that the electroplating theory is incorrect is that there has not been a single piece of electroplated material found anywhere in the ancient Parthian Empire. Frankly, I don't really understand how this ended up even becoming a running theory because there is literally no evidence for it at all. And in my opinion, even though this does have a little bit more scientific diligence than the pseudo-archaeologists who are talking about it, this is almost a surprise to me that archaeologists were genuinely posing this as a potential option. I mean, the only evidence we have is a single battery. There is nothing that was found that was electroplated. There is no wiring. There is no written records of this method being used. I really don't know how this would be able to hold any more water than it powering a light bulb that also doesn't exist. So what this seems like to me is that they saw a clay jar, invented a use for it, invented a way that that use could be achieved, and then published a paper on it. But there is one last electric use which could have a tiny bit of validity to it. That's right, kids. We're talking about religion now. There are some theories which suggest that the battery could have been used for ceremonial purposes. There's a bit of a religious magic trick. You know, you walk up to it and you're like, yo, what's that thing? And you touch it and you go, ooh, God must be real. Now, this is the second most logical explanation for what the electrical purpose could have been next to the electroplating method. But I still really have a hard time believing this, not because I don't think it's possible, but because I just don't see enough evidence for it. As someone whose job has to do with finding evidence before believing something, I just can't, I can't sell myself to that. This also reminds me very heavily of one of my favorite books growing up, which is, uh, for those of you that have heard of it, uh, Motel of the Mysteries. Uh, it's a fiction book about a future, uh, you know, civilization who is uncovering the remains of a lost America buried under the soil, and it chronicles the excavation of a motel. So, as you can see, I mean, as a kid, I was all over this, because, I mean, that's just so fucking cool. But there's one part in it that has always stuck with me, and it is this image. It is the interpretation of a uh, toilet seat as being some sort of ceremonial headdress. And every single time I hear an archaeologist not know what something is and just assume that it is, you know, like, oh, it's ceremonial purpose. It always makes me think of that. It could have been ceremonial, but I think it's a very funny cop-out that I hear so much with almost no evidence. All right, so we're going to move on to the last theory about what it could be. As I mentioned earlier, one of the running theories for what the Baghdad battery could be is a vessel in which to store papyrus. Papyrus obviously would decompose over time, it would fall apart, it was fragile, and so it would make sense to find something to store it in which would improve its lifespan. Now, I mean, it seems like a half-decent idea, but we only have found four of these. One of them had papyrus in it, and the other one had acid in it. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was trying to preserve an important document, I typically wouldn't put it in acid. Plus, the jars are just far too small to hold any sort of manuscripts in any sort of library or anything that people have found in the ancient world. We don't just find tons of these jars. I, I really have a hard time believing this was a storage device. So you might be thinking, okay, Milo, I know that you're a buzzkill. We all know this by now. But what do you think it is? And I'm going to be totally honest with you, I have no fucking idea what it is. It's a trap that I feel like archaeologists and scientists and really anyone falls into where we don't like not knowing what something is, and so we are willing to just grasp at shadows in order to apply a definition to it. I believe that this point is made all the more clear by every single one of the theories in this video, whether it be a conspiracy theorist or a trained archaeologist, having some glaring flaws. The only difference is who's telling it to you. So then you may be thinking, why don't we just go do more studies on the battery? If the battery was analyzed in the 1930s and it's just been sitting around since then, why don't we actually break it out? We could, you know, crack the thing open and get some scientists looking at it. Well, unfortunately, we can't do that. And you're right, there would be a whole lot we could learn if it weren't for... In 2001, in response to the September 11th attacks, then-sitting President George W. Bush 
declared a global war on terror. On March 20th, 2003, the United States launches an assault against the regime of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. While the conflict would upend and destroy millions of lives, it would also play as the stage for an act which some historians refer to as the greatest act of cultural vandalism of our time. On April 5th, 2003, United States forces were advancing on the Iraqi capital of Baghdad. In response to this, the staff and curators at the National Museum of Iraq begin to protect the museum from the coming assault. This involved putting as many artifacts into safe storage as the threat of war loomed. In a matter of days, 8,366 artifacts were managed to be moved to safe locations. But unfortunately, the staff had very little time to protect the entirety of the museum. And by the end of April 8th, all that had worked there had abandoned it, locked the doors, and gone to seek refuge with their friends and loved ones. On April 10th, just 48 hours later, the first looter broke into the National Museum of Iraq. And for the next 36 hours, looters ransacked this culturally irreplaceable site unopposed. And everything that wasn't hidden by the staff was left to their mercy. By the time United States States forces were able to secure the position, more than 15,000 artifacts had been lost. In response to this outright assault on human history, an amnesty program was launched in 2004, which had a startling success seeing the return of almost 2,000 of the missing items. Today, nearly 20 years later, a grand total of 7,000 artifacts have been returned. And while that number is good, nearly 8,000 are still missing. Due to the chaos that the war unleashed in Iraq, the museum wouldn't open again until 2014, and with many empty cases as a testament to the loss. Some of these missing artifacts were a gold and lapis bowl from the royal city of Ur, as well as a beautifully carved duck weight, and nearly 2,600 cylinder seals which were used for imprinting on clay. And alongside the laundry list of missing irreplaceable artifacts were a collection of four five-inch tall clay jars which today we call the Baghdad Batteries. To this day, they have not been recovered, and their whereabouts are still unknown. While it is certainly a disappointing ending, it is a bit of a harrowing reminder of how vicious the international antiquity trade industry is. It's something we don't hear a lot about, as to the lives of the average person, we are far more affected by crime and drug use. But amongst the elite, the trading and selling of irreplaceable artifacts is something which has caused a massive black market, something which can be very tempting to looters who are willing to take the risk due to the enormous payouts. So while I wish I could end this video on an upper, as I so often don't, this story ends with a stark reminder of the cost of war not only to those who lived through it, but to the memory of those who lived before and to the knowledge of those who will come after. And with that, mm, there's a piece of ice in there. I suppose I should probably give this column back. <laughs> Wait, who am I kidding? I haven't picked what the next topic's gonna be yet. I would like to thank all of you for watching this video. And without further ado, why don't we give the roulette wheel its inaugural spin and see what our next episode's gonna be on. Let's give it a little mix up. Da -da -da -da. Oh, shit. Okay, I didn't know that one was gonna come out that quickly, but here we are. <clears throat> Number 27, which is none other than the Gosford Glyphs. Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like next episode we are headed to Australia. I would like to thank you all for watching this video. If you like what I do here and want to hear more archaeological and pseudo-archaeology debunking content, make sure to subscribe and make sure to follow me on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and YouTube, I already said that. And I'd like to give a special thank you to my patrons for making this video possible. Patrons get early ad-free access to all of my videos as a token of my gratitude. And if you're a patron, your name will appear in the credits of this video, so make sure to stick around for that. I would like to thank my editor, John Franco, for all of his unbelievably hard work in making sure that all of you are able to see the best content available. And I'd also like to thank Akari Kuzu for helping me do research for this video. And I would also like to give a big shout out to my viewers, Jackson, McKenna, Violet, Joel, and of course, Katie, who just finished their first dig. Very exciting. I hope that you guys had a ton of fun, even if you did have to be in the Midwest of the United States in order to do it. And of course, I would also like to thank Newport Foodie for allowing me to utilize his unbelievable skills of drink craftsmanship in order to make this series all the more interesting. Remember to stay curious, stay inquisitive. And most importantly, remember, is it racist to have a loving partner? <laughs>